I was going to ask you about one of the most like crazy memories you have, but that must have been probably in the top. That was one of them, but there was, there was a few. There was one guy one time in the first year anniversary, we were having a lovely party at Greywell Cove, which was a private beach. He, he never let us talk him, talk him into throwing another full moon party there. Unfortunately, that place is amazing. But there was this guy who decided, he was walking his dog in the morning, I think, or maybe he was just walking, and he, he saw there was a party down below, and he got too close to the cliff, and he fell down the cliff, Wow. to the bottom where we were and you know nobody stopped because everybody's high and just dancing we're like oh well that's a bit awkward well, we'll just carry on so we didn't want to move, <laughs> the, the, you didn't want to move the guy no one's got a cell phone oh my god! so there's goodness. a guy just sort of sitting there and he landed seems to have landed sitting up so we <laughs> carried on <laughs> oh my god Yeah. And I just, there was a love interest and I, and I came here, you know, I was, I was staying at the, the Globe Hostel mm -hmm. just down the street here. I ended there, up there for two months and there was a love interest. So I, you know, I wanted to come back to be with her. The love interest didn't work out, but the real love interest turned out to be the city itself. Right? Yeah. So I came out here just with a bag like you did and, you know, some DJ mixtapes and, you know, and a suit just in case I would get a job. I never even ended up doing one. <laughs> when did your... Uh your love for like DJing start? Was it before you went to San Francisco? Uh, um, I, I was living in London. I moved to London to, to get a degree in business. And when I was there, I was out clubbing like probably three nights a week, maybe four. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with, you know, the DJ culture in London. I mean, there'd be Giles Peterson playing, you know, at, uh, Talking Loud at this party on Sunday, playing amazing music on Sunday. And it, the dances were just so you know, so beautiful, so into it, so free, but dressed to the nines in jazz suits and stuff. <laughs> and very mixed, white, black, gay, straight and everything. It was cool. Um, and then Acid House exploded when I was in London. Yeah. And I didn't actually necessarily love it at first. It was too, it was too sort of machiny, you know, for me. I was from sort of jazz and hip hop. <laughs> and I went, yeah, it was just, but the kids were going crazy, right? They had this new dance, they had new drugs, they had like little smiley t-shirts and everything. You knew a house head when you saw one. Mm -hmm. um, and then somebody invited me to go to a Tonka, a sound system party where Harvey and Chucky were DJing. And that's when I got it. I was like, oh, wow. I liked the music. It was, they had that acid house, but they also had disco and soul and like, you know, mm -hmm. sort of pop rock hits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the, the atmosphere was ecstatic. And then I remember thinking, wow, you know, what, a, what a thing to be doing, to be moving the crowd like that. You know, maybe, maybe I could do that. You know? But until then, I'd never had that feeling that I actually wanted to be a DJ. So what aspects of DJing um, drew you in initially with like the dancing, the creativity, the travel, the, um, uh, the meditative aspect of it? Hmm. I mean, it was just, well, I've always been into music. So looking at the DJ controlling the crowd, getting this ecstatic thing going on, you know, seeing the, what the, what the emotions you could pull out of people just from playing records mm -hmm. and how creative it was. I mean, I had these mixtapes of Tonka live at the Zap and I listened to those all the time. Uh, Harvey particularly was, was particularly talented and I just remember this one mix that he did where he's playing this hard and I remember because I was at the party but you know you'd study the tape afterwards and there, he would, he played this song Lauren X Machines which is a, a Jack in Chicago track very ma machine you know driven techno we, we never heard that kind of stuff mm -hmm. before right ever and then he just scratched in um Cool and the gang celebrate, and I remember it. It was immaculate mix, but like, and I remember at the club when that dropped, you know, it went from this dark metallic vibe to, you know, celebrate about right? ecstasy all around the club, and that just struck me as like, wow, something so incredible, and do it yourself, right? So you did move in 1990, and you started your iconic uh, um, full moon parties, yeah, uh, the Wicked Sound System uh, parties with you know and um, the rest of the gang, yeah. Um, yeah, so well, we didn't have a sound system there, so we were just wicked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it <was> just wicked. <laughs> yeah. We, I remember the first um, party, Yena had just arrived. I mean, I already had you know friends that were here, 
uh, and we all, I'd already started DJing a little bit, Marky had been out to visit mm. me and he brought some records. But the night Yena came was the night that we all decided as a group, let's go and throw a full moon party. Mm -hmm. So we got this, um, my friend Ernie Munson that was a part of Wicked in those days, very early on for the first six months or something, had a van, a truck, and he knew how to rent a sound system. We went to JK Sound, we got a little sound system. And they didn't know we were going to be on a beach trashing it with sand, so they gave us these beautiful clips. <laughs> speakers, really nice wooden speakers. And after we returned, and they're like, hmm, next time maybe we'll give you like a different set. <laughs> yeah. Not quite so nice. But it was, yeah, it was really small at first, humble, you know, maybe like 40, 50 close friends. Some of our, you know, gay friends that we'd met from the club scene. And us, these are some English ravers. And it grew really quickly. I think the very next week we did our first uh, party in the basement at Big Heart City. Mm. Uh, actually maybe before that I think we I can't remember if that was first or we did a party in the sex shop above um, a sex district above BPM Records that had just opened up oh that's they really cool they had a loft cool. up there that, was, yeah. that might have been the first one actually uh, how did it evolve from doing that on the beach in San Francisco to uh, importing a sound system mm. and getting the Greyhound bus mm. uh, and touring across the US doing right. what well, you're doing well we wanted to have a sound system right away but obviously like a good sound system was, was going to cost some money so I think after the first year of throwing these smaller parties and throwing a lot of full moon parties, we had a pretty substantial following. We started doing bigger club nights mm -hmm. at um, King Street Garage and at Townsend, which is a bigger club that's now been demolished and turned into a parking lot. So we were doing these bigger nights and we started saving all of our money. We pay ourselves just enough to eat mm -hmm. and we saved all the money um, to get this turbo sound rig. It was 15K. It was custom designed by Tony Andrews, who's a very respected English sound you know engineer mm -hmm. sound system engineer he uh, he helped us design it and, he, and then we shipped it over and it, I think it landed in 94 so it took a while mm -hmm. so until then we were renting sound systems and then from there um, we had some friends that were like fans that loved to come to our parties and they were just mad about Wicked and they had just found this bus this beautiful 1947 Greyhound bus mm -hmm. in a scrapyard and it, you know it was in a state of disrepair but it had belonged to this Baptist church group it had all this history and it was just, you know, ready for the next chapter, right? So my friend Clay and CB and his, his crew, you know, cleaned it all up, ripped out all the seats, put in new seats and everything. And they're like, well, we'll tour with you. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll drive you around. So then we had a bus, a sound system, a posse, and we just kind of took America by storm. I had so much fun doing it. How did touring with the rest of the Wicked Sound System on the bus and playing events like Burning Man and Reggae, Reggae on the River influence um, and inspire you as a producer when mm. you made that switch? Well, that's a good question. Um, it wasn't really all of us that toured, at the, that did those parties. It was actually me and Marky that would do Reggae on the River mm -hmm. and Burning Man. Uh, Thomas moved away at that point, around 95, he moved to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And that's when we did our first, set up the first sound system at Burning Man, the first big sound system at Burning Man. Um, yeah, it was inspiring because it was the first time we'd ever heard the sound system um, properly. It's made for festivals, it's made to be an outdoor system, so there's nothing, it sounds way better when there's nothing and no walls to get in the way. You know, it just sounds acoustically perfect out there. Didn't even have to EQ it, just yeah. turn it on and boom, you know. So that was nice, so that was inspiring. The music sounded diff different, it sounded better. Um, and Reggae on the River, again, CB and my friends that had the bus, they were already going to Reggae on the River, they were reggae heads. They yeah. just got into Wiki because they thought that we were kind of we had this psychedelic dubby thing going on. That was their connection to it. So th I remember CB telling me, "I'm bringing you up to Reggae on the River," and he bought me a ticket. And he goes, "We're going to have you DJ. We're going to we we bring the bus up there every year. We're just going to set up the decks, and you're going to DJ all night." And there wasn't anybody else doing it then, so we just had this kind of DIY attitude of just plugging in and going. No one else was doing it. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And then uh, first year I played house, but then the next year I played dub. I figured it was a reggae festival. It was rude of me just to show up with house music. And it went down really well, so much so that 10 years later, we were still doing the, you know, the, the sound system after the stage died down all night. And we were the only one that they would allow to do it because we were self-policing. We were like, you know, we were good like that. We had had a good crew of people that took care of, you know, our people, all of us basically, make sure nothing stupid happened. Yeah, respect for... Yeah, you know. Um, so in 1996, Wicked Records first and one of the most successful releases, 20 Minutes of Disco Glory. Yeah. It was a collaboration between you and ETI. Yeah. Um, 
How did that collaboration come about? What was the experience like? Um, yeah, I met um, I met Tim and Eric through um, CB and the bus and those guys. He was like, you know, they, they were part of that crew. They were living up in Humboldt, and um, they were already start, They were already making some music. Mm -hmm. They'd started. They'd put one record out, I think. And I just remember thinking at Burning Man in 96, I had this big, was it 95? Maybe it was 95, yeah, 95. I just had a revelation when I was there. Like, I really want to make a record. I need to make a record in order to kind of, you know, go to the next level. And I'm going to hook up with Eric because we are, I wanted to just work, you know, with him because he and I had a good rapport. And uh, he's like, well, me and, uh, you know, our studio set up at Tim's house, so come over. So we went over there together and I had some samples. Um, of stuff that I wanted it, you know, that were an inspiration, you know, and I had a bass line in my head. So I remember, I couldn't play anything, but, you know, I could do like a, you know, they turn the keyboard on and I remember playing the bass line. And um, they're like, that's awesome, um, cool. And then they pitched it down, I think, from what I was playing it. And then Tim Boone was pretty good with the 303, the acid making machine. So then he duped that and made another acid line out of that. And so then um, we decided, well, let's bring in a live bass player to play the bass notes so it would just sound more full because I was into this kind of disco, you know, stuff, production. I really mm. liked that disco production more than anything, like Bo Hannon and Patrick Cowley, like the producers that had this really big, epic, cosmic sound. I wanted that with acid. That was the dream. And um, so we brought in this bass player and he was really good at listening to, you know, what I... I was just humming the stuff and he was able to display it. And at one point um, I said, oh, can you do a little slap bass stuff? And he did this little slap bass bit and it was perfect. So that became the break in the song. And it just came together like that. We found a percussionist. I worked with him. I played on my pattern basically and then he played it better. And we recorded all that. And then it was, it was a really successful record. We sold like 20,000 copies in the end. Not all on Wicked Records. I did remixes on Greyhound later as well. Mm -hmm. So it obviously got me really fired up. Yeah. That was the first one. Yeah, you put out a, a lot of releases since yeah, then. That was the um, one, In 1998, you founded mm. um, Greyhound Recordings, which was a nod to the Greyhound bus that you guys mm. toured on. Yeah. Um, so, and I've released 54 singles from the from California recording artists, um, and became the home label for your own projects and singles. What was the goal and the mission of your label when you first started it? How did that come about? Yeah, oh, well, I just wanted to keep sticking out my own records without having to deal with you know the man right? or, or anybody else really. You know, I, I like it's just so much better when you, there's no bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd done three records on Wicked, but it was it was supposed to be a joint project, and at that point, it hadn't turned into a group project. Right? The other guys weren't ready. So I just was like, okay, I'm just gonna let that sit for a bit and then I'm gonna just start my own thing. Cause it didn't seem fair, you know, Wicked Records featuring Garth again, right? So the first uh, few records were by, by, were by me and then people start, and then I, you know, I hit up obviously my Wicked homies to see if they would want to contribute and they did. Thomas did an amazing track, The Mirror Boys, um, you know, Yana and Margie did really good remixes of the Disco Glory. Uh, and stuff like that. So, and then people started sending in their demos, and I was like, "Wow, this is interesting." You know, <laughs> listen to people's music. So I always had a stack of demos to listen to. Occasionally, there'd be something that really hit the spot and sounded like what we were trying to do. So that's how it, it just grew. You played three times now at Hospitality. This will be your fourth time. Uh, the, the first time you actually did really? it. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I asked Victor. Yeah, nice. he said this will be your fourth time. Nice. The first time you played Open to Close. Uh, how any standout memories from your past hospitality experiences? I remember the back to back one with Yana was a total roaster. That was really good. I mean, those those uh, yeah. <laughs> the sets that you guys do together are pretty historic. Really, really long Another back to back. <laughs> <laughs> because because it's like you guys, you guys, it's longevity. It's like you guys back to back for hours, and they're epic journey sets. I love it. I, I mean, there's no one else I would rather play back to back with than that guy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. It's seamless. It's like you know, we just you know we can throw each other a curveball and, and work with it and come right out of it with you know with something that made it even better. You know, it's beautiful. It's like a rare. tennis match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but not competitive, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. It's yeah, it's a beautiful thing, and it's rare. Um, that we started doing these extended sets in Japan because they're kind of greedy over there, and they like you know they like they like you to play for hours and hours and hours. 
and even we were surprised after like nine hours or something we're like are we still going they, are they still here you know? <laughs> so now we can do that and it's no problem I think we just we just did it in LA at a friend's um, party what's yeah. the longest you've ever back to back I think nine hours might be it actually but um, I've the longest set I've ever played is 15 hours it was the closing night that was just me all night that was um, oh, wow the closing night of 39 Hotel in Hawaii it was the club that Harvey was involved with. Yeah. And they knew that they were closing it forever. And it had been such a lovely club. They'd been there 10 years. So we just kept on going. Yeah. <laughs> and going and going. That's a long time. literally, it was like a war zone. When we, when we got out of there, like some, someone had broken their leg. I mean, I could barely, like, my back was like, you know, I could barely move. I mean, it was, yeah. it was putting the hours, man. We went out strong. Yeah.